I hope you all are having a wonderful week. My name is Yupari and I'd like to welcome you to this portrait painting video where I will be guiding you through the steps involved in creating this oil painting. And we're going to focus on the idea that painting is nothing more than a visual puzzle. And here we have our model Emily, and I'm going to keep an image of her to the top left corner of your screen so you can refer to it as the painting develops. I'm going to start off by listing the colors on my palette. So I have zinc, white, burnt umber, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, yellow ochre, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. And if at any point in this video you become curious as to exactly what materials I'm using, all of that information will be typed up for you in the description box below. So if you're curious, just go ahead and scroll down and it'll all be typed up for you. So what we're starting off with now is a ground color. So we're kind of trying to we're kind of trying to mix a local flesh tone. So we just encountered a variety of different mixtures and it all started off with a combination of just cadmium red, yellow ochre, and lead white to begin with. And then we started bringing down the saturation of the cadmium red by adding in the burnt umber. And so that's a quick and easy flesh tone for you there. Cadmium red, lead white, yellow ochre, and then burnt umber. Can't go wrong with that mixture. And I added in a few extra flavors of color in there, uh, but the majority of the paint mixtures consist of just a variety of cadmium red, yellow ochre, lead white, and burnt umber. And I will say, if you don't want to use lead white, you don't have to. The only reason I'm using lead white is because it's a transparent white and it has a heavy body to it. And I really like the feeling of the, the lead white while I'm painting. So if you want to use something like titanium white or zinc white or whichever kind of white you want to use, go ahead. That's perfectly fine. And so what I'm doing is I'm putting in a kind of uh, little blob here, just a little shape of color. Uh, to indicate to me where I want to place the face. And now this strategy of portrait painting is completely different to my previous videos. Uh, although if you've seen last week's video where I titled it uh, Breaking the Rules, this is the approach that I kind of uh, invented. I'm sure other painters paint in this way, but notice how I'm just painting in just a little blob of color. And this little blob of color is going to basically be the ground that I lay the other colors on top of. So I'm going to keep it with that basic local flesh color that I mixed. And I'm going to draw on top of it with burnt umber and a tiny little round brush. So again, I'm going to keep that color that I made. And now I'm going to search for the angle between the eyes. And I'm going to try to nail this angle as perfectly as I possibly can, almost with the accuracy that, say, an archer would have if they were trying to uh, use their bow and arrow. I'm trying to achieve the most accurate angle that I possibly can between the two eyes, and everything will be constructed off of that one angle. So now if you see that other brush stroke that I put in there, that's for the corner of the side of the face, and here we have the corner of the side of the face to the other direction. So let's just look at the space between uh, the sides of the face. So that's my little caliper there just to get an idea of where I think the face is going to fit. And it's okay if things move around here or there. But the most important thing is going to be the angle between the two eyes. So now we have the corner of the side of one eye socket. Now we're starting to turn uh, the eye socket into a more precise shape. Let's not forget the angle between the eyebrows. And that angle should be very similar to the angle of the eyes. Very, very simple. Now we just indicated the angle of the eyebrows. And so we're going to build the rest of the portrait based off of this angle. So that was a little bit too tall. So let's lower that angle a little bit. So we just lowered it a little bit and angled it a little more than the angle of the eye. So let's just correct that with the uh, flesh color. So a little strategy here, that flesh color that we mixed up is also going to help us out 
not only as a ground tone for the flesh colors to come, but also for erasing purposes. So now we have a little mark here for uh, the tear duct and now the side of the eye. Again, tear duct and the side of the eye. Now you can see we're starting to develop the eye socket uh, to the right of your screen with just a few simple brush strokes. And now we have a little straight line there for the eyebrow. Now, the thing about portraiture is that you can approach it so many different ways. And I usually try to look for different approaches to create portrait paintings. Otherwise, I'd be creating the same video over and over and over again. So now you can see how I'm looking at the distance between the eyes. So sometimes I'll start very general and then add the specificity. And uh, recently, I've been trying to go for specificity a lot quicker and so that's why you see me using the caliper and i encourage you to work in a variety of different ways especially if you're just starting out uh, be aware that there are so many different ways to approach portrait painting if you've seen any of my previous videos you'll you'll notice that i have applied so many different techniques and this is just one of the many techniques that i want to try and now we have uh, the little shape for the eyebrow. Notice how everything is building kind of step by step off of the angle between the eyes. Remember the angle between the eyes is literally like the cornerstone to a building. Is the framework from which everything else is going to be constructed on top of. And so we're just trying to keep our shapes very simple and easy to understand. I'm not trying to create a perfectly polished and finished outline. Instead, we're trying to figure out where everything fits in relation to one another. So here we've drawn in uh, the side of the eye socket. And here we have the little uh, corner for the tear duct. And so I just want to know where the tear ducts fit onto the angle between the eyes. Think about the angle between the eyes as kind of like a railroad. And the eyes are kind of like train uh, trains on the railroad track. They have to follow that track. So now we have the corner of the side of the uh, forehead. So let's use our little caliper here to help us make sure that that angle between the eyebrows is as accurate as possible. And so uh, this kind of makes some kind of logical sense if you think about it. We're starting with something that is true. So the idea, start with something true and build more truthful statements based off of that one true statement. So that statement that was true in the beginning was the angle between the eyes. There's no guessing here. We're trying to objectively figure out each and every little shape. And uh, now we have the distance from the top of the hairline to the eyebrows and we're going to bring that down to make a little comparison look at these two comparisons and um, we're going to notice that the nose needs to fall a little bit further down than the distance between uh, the hairline to the eyebrows and so that's the measurement that we're going to uh, try and stick to because you can either go up and measure this on your model if you're working from life or just take it directly from the photo reference. And now all of these shapes are going to have to relate to one another. And this is how you relate your shapes to one another. The top of the hairline to the eyebrow is a specific relationship that can be understood. Now we have the side of the uh, hairline to the side of the face, the um, cheekbone region right here. And this has an angle that we can also objectively measure. And it's not so much about being afraid of making mistakes, rather it's about gathering information. So at this point, at this early stage, we're gathering information. So uh, just remind yourself whenever you're in your first sitting or your first pass on your portrait paintings or drawings, just tell yourself you're, you're in the information gathering stage. You're just trying to gather information and learn how to work with that information. Every environment is going to be a little bit different, uh, but the one thing that never change 
or the one thing that will never change will be the principles behind uh, composing an image. And so that is the shape, the value, and the color. And so we're focusing on the shape right now. So we just drew in the iris to the left of your screen. And now we're going to relate that shape uh, to the iris to the right of your screen. So now we're going to start to uh, make this shape and look at the distance between uh, the iris to the left of your screen and the iris to the right of your screen. Mm -hmm. Trying to make sure that these shapes match up perfectly or at least as perfect as we can possibly make them. Now we're going to use a little bit more of the burnt umber and just cut right into the corner of the eye right about there and just try to carve out the most exacting shape as possible. So the idea behind this uh, burnt umber drawing on top of the uh, flesh tone is that that flesh tone is serving as a ground for the other flesh tones to fit and the burnt umber is a very neutral and non-invasive color to build other colors on top of. That's the whole reasoning behind these color combinations here. So let's use the caliper again. So let's compare the width of this eye to the distance between the eyes. They kind of match up. Now in the photo reference, this eye right here is actually a little bit smaller. So we're going to carve that in. And the reason it appears a little bit smaller is because the model's head is turned three-quarter relative to us, meaning we're going to see more of the right side of her face than we are going to see of the left side of her face. So now let's make this little measurement here. Uh, just a little pattern here from one, uh, the corner of one eye to the corner of the other eye. And then we made a vertical and saw that that needed to match up with the top of the hairline, which means that the hairline needs to move up. And now you can see how we're starting to relate. It's all about relating shapes to one another. So the corner of the eyes, so the furthest distance of the eye to the left to the furthest distance of the eye to the right is a very definitive distance, a very definitive line. And we use that to measure from the hairline down to the center line or sorry, down to the axis of the eyes. That's how we're relating our shapes to one another. Always look for patterns, always look for relationships uh, within your subject, uh, such as that one that I just described, uh, to help you further uh, f facilitate your drawing. And so now we're starting to etch in the side of the eye socket, just a little shape right here indicating the corner of the eye socket. And we also made some indications for the bottom eyelids, so the lower eyelids. We're starting to etch in a little bit of a value change now uh, using the burnt umber. And less burnt umber and more of the flesh tone uh, that we created, that initial flesh tone, will create a, a very simple value transition. It doesn't mean that we're going to let that value transition be the final thing that we place onto the surface. We can actually work wet on wet on top of these shapes. All right, so let's double check this little measurement that I was talking about again. Let's see how this matches up. And so it looks like the forehead needs to move up a little bit higher. Now you can see how we're building everything off of that angle between the eyes. Very simple and easy to understand these shapes to one another. And so let's make the little uh, mark for the top of the hairline. It needed to move up yet a little bit more. So maybe this will be the final measurement. Maybe it won't. Let's check. Now that looks much closer uh, to the model. So now we're just going to push it just a little higher up uh, just to be sure. And when we come in with the uh, the hairline, that edge is going to be really, really soft. So we just want to be sure that we place the top of the hairline where it needs to be placed. Now it looks like it's where it needs to be. Now let's go ahead and check the top of the hairline to the eyebrows again. Run that measurement down. And remember, the nose needs to come down a little bit further so that 
actually that mark that we made for the nose looks about right. Now remember, the hairline to the eyebrows is a third, and then the eyebrows down to the nose is another third. Usually, that's the general canon of proportion, but it's different with every model. But you can use those things to relate to one another. Now, let's go ahead and run a vertical from the tear duct. We're using a T-square to run a vertical down. We're going to use the T-square again to run another vertical down from the uh, tear duct to the right of your screen. Now we're going to make some more objective uh, comparisons here. And so we're going to use these vertical lines to help us uh, objectively compare where the nose needs to fit in relation to the eyes. So again, let's look at the angle between the eyes. And again, let's run that angle in comparison with the angle that we place for the nose. And they should be very, very similar. Now I know they're in perspective, uh, but those angles are going to be extremely similar um, with the angle of the nose pointing a little bit further inward. Very tiny little angle change. Almost imperceptible. So now let's look at the corner of the side of the nostril and relate that to the uh, vertical that we drew down from the uh, tear duct. And so we see now that the nostril to the right of your screen is actually going to overlap with that vertical line that we placed from the tear duct. That little tiny overlap is going to uh, basically help us gauge the width of the nose. Uh, so it's kind of like when you were in in school and you needed to look at a graph. The graph had two coordinates, right? A vertical coordinate, a horizontal coordinate, and it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. I know you understand what a vertical distance means, and I know that you understand what a horizontal distance means. And it's the same kind of thinking when you're drawing the portrait, the same exact basic thinking. So that is the horizontal distance is being figured out based on those vertical lines that we placed down. So again, let's look at another comparison. The width of an eye should be about the width of the nose. And that's a general rule of thumb, but it's a little different in this uh, view because the model is in three-quarter view, but they're so similar on the photo reference. They're so similar. So we can use that uh, relationship to help us gain more accuracy with our drawing. So now that we're starting to uh, place the nose in relationship to the angle between the eyes, now you can really see that it's a visual puzzle. Now you can see the uh, concept of a visual puzzle. That is, we start with something that is true, that is the angle between the eyes, start with something is tr that is true, and continue to build more truthful statements based on that one statement in the beginning, which is the angle of the eye is exactly here, and it is exactly this. And so again, we're going to use the angle of the eye, and we're going to use uh, the width of the eye, and make sure that that distance is correct. I'm telling you, it's like, like they say, measure twice, cut once in portrait, you kind of want to measure like nine times. And then only then can you be kind of sure. So let's use another little trick here. So the here's the angle of the eyes again. And let's just run a perpendicular, a perpendicular line, uh, just to make sure that the nose is placed accurately in relation to the center line. So I'll repeat myself, the axes of the eye, so the angle of the eye, remember that one truthful statement that we started with in this visual puzzle, we are drawing a perpendicular line according to the angle of the eyes, which gives us the angle of the nose. So again, the center line is perpendicular to the angle between the eyes. I'll repeat myself again. The angle between the eyes is perpendicular to the center line. And it's also the 
true saying that the center line is perpendicular to the angle of the eyes. Nothing more complicated than that. And that statement alone, that deduction alone, is going to give us the placement of the nose. Or, sorry, the orientation of the nose. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and mix up all of the flesh tones that we're going to want to use. So we're going to be using a combination of lead white, our red, and our yellow in the lighter values. And then we're going to use a little bit more alizarin crimson sap green in the middle lights. And now, as you've seen, we've moved a little further down the value scale, we have a little more influence of the burnt umber into the mix. And now we're going to mix up the color for the sclera of the eye. So let's just combine our white and our ivory black, which will give us a nice cool gray blue-ish color. And we're going to use this for the sclera of the eye. And the sclera of the eye is the white of the eye. And the white of the eye is not bright white. It's in fact a neutral gray. It's almost like a half tone in this uh, image. And so another little trick to, to note is that if you can figure out what your local color is, uh, so that local color that we mixed in the beginning, we tried to mix the local color as accurately as we possibly could, uh, kind of color matching it. If you can figure it out, you can mix all of the other colors based on that one local flesh color. And color describes the characteristics of the light extremely well. And we're working in natural light. So in natural light, there's not going to be too much contrast. The most contrast you'll actually see is going to be right here, right in the iris of the eye contrasting with the sclera of the eye. And this is kind of why you see eyes first when you look at someone. Not always the case, but I, I find that, at least for me, I'm pretty sure that this is why my eyes are drawn to other people's eyes uh, when we first meet or in any kind of conversation because of the contrast, the dramatic contrast between the uh, dark of the eye and the light of the eye. Now that's not always the case with the uh, different colored eyes and such. But I, that's one reason I think that I'm drawn at least to the eyes uh, with this image. Now it's a little more ivory black. We're uh, going to make the little dots here for the pupils of the eye. And now we're going to go in uh, with the white that we use for the sclera and just a little dabble in a little highlight. The highlight is almost right on the uh, the pupil of the eye. Very simple, very simplistic little touch there for the highlight. Now we're going to go back into the halftone region of the palette and let's add a little bit of alizarin crimson into this mixture. And this is going to be for the uh, bottom eyelid. Now remember it's all a visual puzzle. And so I described to you how we started building the shapes based off of the angle of the eyes, but what about the values? Uh, remember, value just means how light or how dark something is. So basically, every plane that is closest in angle to the light source that is, every plane that is most perpendicular to the light source is going to be receiving more light. And all of the planes that are closer to parallel to the light source are going to receive less light. And I know you can work with puzzles. I know you can do it. I know you're very good at puzzles if you take your time with the puzzles. And so that's all this is. It's a puzzle. And just like all puzzles, the more you work with them, the better and better you get at them. And that's how you build your skill level through your experience. And so with the values, try to understand that each value change that you're applying onto the surface is a plane change. So the uh, lower eyelids are darker in value, not because the lower eyelids are darker, but because the lower eyelids are angled away from the light. 
Now another little uh, value change that will happen not because of the angle of the uh, plane is something like say the eyebrows. The eyebrows are darker because the eyebrows are darker. But when you look at this plane that we're painting in here for the side of the face, that very uh, simple plane change that we indicated, that plane change is indicating our value change. So that value, or this value over here, is getting darker, not because that area of the flesh is darker, but because that plane is angling away from the light a little bit more. And so now here's another little trick, uh, or another little thing to keep in mind, especially when you're working in something like North Light. The color hues uh, will not change that much. So I'll repeat myself. The hue will not change that much. So if you figure out your local color, the other colors that you create will not be that different than that local flesh color, but the value will be a little bit darker. And so now you can tell on the palette, we're placing in some darker shapes here uh, for the side of the eye socket. So right about here, the shape is darker. Again, darker not because it's darker on the model, but because that angle is turning away from the light. And this little angle here is, as well is also uh, getting a little bit darker. And so the color changes on the model aren't going to be that drastic. Some areas will necessitate a hue change, in particular a temperature change. And so right about here, notice we used a little bit of a lizard and crimson for the lower eyelid. A lizard and crimson is a nice sneaky red. It's a very good tinting red. That's why I love keeping a lizard and crimson on my palette for portrait, because a lizard and crimson is so it's it's so good at tinting colors to be red-ish. Now the lower eyelids are a little bit red-ish, and now the side of the eye socket here is a little bit green-ish, but the hue of the lower eyelid is closer to the alizarin side than the local flesh colors. Another area we're going to vary the hue a little bit is going to be when we get there, uh, the lips. But as you can see, the hues, remember the hue just means the color itself, the hues surrounding these value changes around the eye socket are not changing that much. Now the eyebrow is not included because the eyebrow contains a definitive color change. The eyebrow is a little closer to a uh, warm greenish, so kind of sap green with burnt umber, whereas the lights, the value, I'm sorry, the color changes within the lights are almost imperceptible. I, I find that it's much harder to find color changes within the light areas of the face than it is to find value changes. And now we're going to start to place in some of the lights starting with the uh, the nasal bone. Notice that dot in between the eyes. That little dot is a landmark for me that I placed in earlier to indicate the beginning of the nose and the nose starts with the nasal bone and the nasal bone is a little bit higher up than the angle between the eyes. And I will constantly keep referring to the angle between the eyes because that's the one thing we started all of this with. Remember, it's all a visual puzzle. And now we're starting to add some plane changes onto the nose. So we started off with the light light on the top plane of the nose. And remember, top plane just means a plane uh, that's facing the light a little bit more so the top plane of the nose, the lighter portion of the nose, that plane is closer to being perpendicular to the light source. And right about here in the shadow right underneath the nostril, this area is in shadow because the plane change as the, as the flesh tones uh, approach the shadow 
become closer and closer to parallel. And this is one of the most important aspects of this visual puzzle, that you get the value transitions, or that you place in the value transitions based on the uh, three-dimensional understanding that you have of the angle between each little plane. And it's most important that you understand it between the large planes. The smaller planes are a little bit easier to figure out. It's just a matter of... Uh, putting in little dabs of paint, but these large plane changes, these are going to be the most important plane changes. And all the little tiny ones are going to be much easier to fit within these larger plane changes. Again, these large plane changes are the most important plane changes towards uh, getting the structure to look uh, more and more volumetric, more and more uh, realistic. And uh, the last little large plane change we'll put in there is for the top plane of the cheek, the little zygomatic region here. And all of the smaller plane changes are going to be much easier to fit in. It's just a matter of taking your time and placing in the smaller plane changes. But these are the large planes that are going to require your immediate attention early on within this puzzle. And a little bit of burnt umber here. Let's just neutralize this area a little bit. So this little area on the side of the nasal bone, we just want to make that a little more subtle. And try to work your way up to the highlight. Sometimes it'll, uh, you'll see me just jump in for the highlights. Uh, but with this one, I really tried to build up the lights uh, until I got to the point of the highlight. And the highlight is not just straight white. The highlight is white with a little bit of yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is a nice yellowish, kind of a tinting color. And we're even going to put a little bit of it, uh, we put a little bit on the top plane of the nose. And now the next highlight that's going to demand uh, some attention is going to be right here on the corner of the uh, eye socket. As the uh, form of the eye socket beneath the lower eyelid starts to approach, uh, the side plane of the nose. And remember, just like most puzzles, you can take information that's already given to you and deduce new information. So we took the width of the eye and we actually used that length to give us the distance between the root of the nose and the uh, middle of the two lips. So again, the width of the eye is the length that gave us the distance between the root of the nose and the middle between the upper lip and the lower lip. And now we're starting to draw in the shape of the uh, philtrum. So that little teardrop looking shape that you imagine just above the uh, upper lip is what we drew in there for the distance between the root of the nose and the mouth. And so now we have the top of the upper lip, so the top middle portion of the upper lip, the middle between the upper lip and the lower lip, and now we have the side of the lip to the left of your screen and the side of the lip to the right of your screen. And we're trying to relate uh, each of these shapes based on the shapes that we have already established. And now we have the little curve here for the bottom of the lower lip. Uh, now remember the principle of proportion is all about relating things to one another. It's all relative. Everything is being placed based on this angle right here. This angle that you're looking at between the eyes, again, is the cornerstone to everything. And even the angle of the mouth is going to be extremely similar to the angle between the eyes. Very, very similar. So now let's just use a little uh, vertical. So we're going to draw a vertical here from the corner of the nose. Uh, so let's look at the corner of the nose to the corner of the mouth. Remember, we know that the nose is where it needs to be, right? We based the placement of the nose based on the eyes. So the way it works is that we figured out where the eyes needed to be based on the angle between the eyes. Then using that information, we figured out where the nose needed to go. 
and we figured out the center line of the nose, which is also the center line of the entire head. Now, based on the nose, we're constructing the mouth. So the mouth is going to fit based on the nose. All right, so the way that we're constructing the mouth is that we're using that ground flesh tone, so that um, local flesh tone that we put onto the panel first. And we're going in with a very simple color mixture for the mouth. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, the mouth would be one of the areas that would necessitate a hue change. And so there is a hue change. And so this color combination is nothing more complicated than burnt umber, alizarin crimson, yellow ochre. And that's about it. There's nothing more complicated to this mixture for the color of the lips. Remember, it doesn't, it, it's not so vital that you get the exact color for the lips but what is important is that you place the lips in the correct location and you describe the values within the lips accurately so that's what we're aiming for so we're starting off with the darker regions of the lips this is kind of the order of operations of things if you want to think about it like that First it's shape, then it's value, then it's color. Color rests on top of the understanding of the value, and the value rests on top of the understanding of the shape. That's just the way that these things work. And so now we have uh, the top plane of the lower lip. And again, nothing more complicated than a alizarin, white, burnt umber, and a little bit of yellow ochre. Nothing more complicated than that. And so now we have the bottom plane, so the side plane of the lower lip. All we did was just use a little more burnt umber and alizarin crimson with that mixture. And with the top plane of the lower lip, it's pretty much just more white and alizarin crimson. Now we're going to look at the uh, top plane of the orbicularis oris. Remember the orbicularis oris? Or, that is just a nice way of saying the structure that encompasses the mouth. So remember, it's not just uh, some lips that are floating in space there, uh, but they are existing within a structure. And so uh, we're going to get to that structure now. So the corner of the lip, this little plane change is going to indicate to me that the value surrounding the corner of the lip needs to get darker. Now that little plane change is not specific yet. We're going to make each one of these plane changes uh, as specific as we possibly can. So let's indicate the little accent between the upper lip and the lower lip. That isn't a plane change. It is a conjunction between one form and another form. So that is the uh, conjunction between the upper lip and the lower lip creates a little boundary there that receives almost no light that gets lighter. And in contrast, the top plane of the uh, upper lip uh, right on the bottom of the philtrum is actually much lighter and it's receiving a highlight and a little bit above it uh, right over here on the side this area is going to be darker remember it's not darker because that area of her face is darker but it's darker because that plane is angling away from the light more than the planes surrounding it and now we're just going to adjust a little shape there for the corner of the mouth. And you can also tell uh, that the mouth is very simple uh, to construct. So that's why we started off with the eyes, because the eyes are much more difficult to move around and to adjust. Um, and the nose is also a little bit more difficult, but the mouth, if the mouth is in the wrong place, it's much easier to adjust the mouth than to adjust, say, uh, one of the eyes. And so now the uh, top plane of the upper lip, we actually added a little bit more white. So just a little bit more of the lead white and the alizarin crimson mixture. Notice I didn't really use cadmium red for the lips. Remember, I have two reds on my palette, but I chose with the alizarin crimson because it's 
it's a nice tinting red so it's not such a dominating red the cadmium red is much more of a dominating red and it would have given her kind of like a lipstick type color for her lips which is not the look that i was going after and now this plane right here is the bottom plane of the cheekbone the zygomatic region of the face remember zygomatic also just stands for basically cheekbone area and so that area needs to relate now to the orbicularis oris Remember, it's all a visual puzzle, and everything needs to connect to everything else. Just think about it as a visual puzzle. Don't think about it as painting a portrait. Don't think about it as uh, painting an image of your friend or of your relative or whoever you're painting. Just think about it as a visual puzzle. And if you don't like the word puzzle, just think about it as a bunch of shapes that you're relating to one another. Just relate the shapes to one another. Now we have the bottom of the lower lip. We have a darker value there and a darker value to the right of the lip. And now we're going to start to put in the uh, half tone, uh, pretty much the dark light for the corner of the side of the face. And this dark light is going to be a very simple color combination of yellow ochre, burnt umber, and a little bit of our lead white. It's a little closer to the greenish. I'm kind of pushing the cooler uh, colors as the planes start to turn away from the light. And now we're just going to etch in using that same color combination I told you, the bottom uh, shape for the chin. And now with the uh, a little bit of burnt umber onto the brush we're going to draw out the uh, outside shape of the face let's try to get it with a single brush stroke let's just turn the brush in there that should be about the uh, corner of the side of the face now let's go ahead with the same brush just try to adjust the edge between the corner of the mouth and the surrounding flesh tones and so let's add a little bit more of the uh, alizarin crimson with ivory black now remember that the uh, distance between the eyebrows to the bottom of the nose is roughly one third and from the bottom of the nose to the chin is another third that's usually the case but it's a little different with the model so let's measure first so here we have this distance here and so the line that we placed pretty much matches up uh, with that rule that the uh, bottom of the nose to the chin is one third, but that's not the case here. So the bottom of the chin actually comes down a little bit further. So that is the distance between the bottom of the nose to the chin is very similar to that of the eyebrows to the bottom of the nose, but the only exception is that the distance from the bottom of the nose to the chin is a little bit longer. All that means is that the bottom of the nose to the chin is roughly a third but a little bit larger. That's it. Just a little bit larger. And that little bit will give us a ton of specificity. And remember portraiture is all about your specificity. You're trying to record your shapes. You're trying to analyze your shapes and make them as specific as you possibly can and so now with the little drawing brush with the burnt umber we're going to just try to figure out now the uh, outside shape of the face now remember everything is being constructed uh, based on the angle between the eyes so even the contour of the face is being constructed uh, based on the shapes that came before them now here we have a little outline so let's just trace out the uh, boundary between the light and shadow we really want to know what this shape is going to look like so again with the drawing brush that curves in about there and uh, maybe the mouth comes out a little further and so let's turn and it goes right about there all right so now let's paint in a little bit more specificity uh, for the chin so remember the mouth is encapsulated by the orbicularis oris. I know some artists have said that the imagine the mouth is the face uh, turning in on itself. 
which is kind of a, a kind of a gruesome way to look at it, but that's one way you could look at it. Um, so now let's look at the outside shape right about here. So that dark value is indicating a plane change as the uh, mouse starts to curve inwards uh, surrounding the curvature of the form. And so now we're starting to paint in uh, or we're starting to fill in the shadow shape. And this color combination is nothing more complicated uh, than burnt umber, lead white, a touch of sap green, and a lizard and crimson, and nothing more than that. And so let's just finish up this shape here for the bottom of the chin. And so first, let's just make sure that this light and shadow shape is as uh, distinct as we possibly uh, as we can possibly make it. All right, so now let's look at these planes here as the angle away from the light. So the orbicularis oris right around here is curving inwards towards the chin. And the chin is wrapping around and turning away from us as it approaches uh, the mandible. So that means that this value change here is going to be fairly dark and very, uh, it's going to be a very rapid change in value. And so now this plane change, this is the bottom of the orbicularis oris, and it's going to be darker uh, than, say, the light of the chin. And this area here is uh, the side of the orbicularis oris as it turns away from us. And this is, of course, the top plane of the chin. Now let's paint in the dark light. Remember the dark light is one of the most important half tones in the face because it describes the uh, transition between light and shadow, literally, because the dark light is the uh, value in the light just as you approach the shadow. It, the dark light is basically the value that dictates the edge between light and shadow. And so that's why we're trying to make this little uh, dark light on the corner here as uh, soft of a transition as we possibly can make it. And this plane here is going to be a little bit lighter, just a little bit lighter over there. And let's just soften this edge around the corner of the orbicularis oris. And now we're going to soften this little transition by adjusting that value, making that value a little bit darker, and making this value here a little bit lighter to just create a little bit more subtlety. Very much just softening that little transition there. All right, so here we are the next day. So we let the painting dry in that stage. Yes, we let the painting dry in that stage. Uh, so what we're doing is we're oiling out the lights. So we're using our medium. Uh, and our medium is Neo McGilp. Uh, Neo McGilp. And again, if you want to know exactly what medium I'm using, along with the other materials I'm using, all of that information will be typed up for you in the description box below. So just go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of this video and uh, right there in the bottom of the description, uh, you'll see that I have the materials typed up for you. So remember, this is a visual puzzle. So one way to think about it is if you like to, uh, to work with jigsaw puzzles, uh, one technique that you can use for a jigsaw puzzle is that you figure out the edges of your jigsaw puzzle, the corners of the rectangle for your jigsaw puzzle. And a lot of people figure out the corners of the jigsaw puzzle first uh, because those are the basically the hardest ones to find. And once you have the corners of your jigsaw puzzle, then the rest of the uh, shapes become much simpler to find. At least that is what I've been told. All right, so when you're uh, going to work on a painting, uh, basically when you're going to work wet over dry, meaning we're working on a dry painting, you want to make sure to oil it out just so that um, the paint application is a little bit uh, more manageable. So that's why we apply the medium over top of the dry painting. And so now what we're doing is we're uh, remixing our flesh tones that we made previously. Remember those combinations of color were was um, those combinations were nothing more than the red, white, and then 
yellow. So that is cadmium red, lead white, yellow ochre, and then burnt umber. And that is the majority, uh, that composes the majority of these flesh tones with the addition of the sap green and alizarin crimson. Remember, sap green and alizarin crimson were colors or are colors that were basically made for each other. They go hand in hand very nicely on the palette. So now for the darker shapes, we're using pretty much just the burnt umber uh, with the combination of alizarin crimson and sap green. And as we go even darker, we're going to introduce some more ultramarine blue into the mixture. And if you're curious as to how to save your paints, uh, when you're done with each sitting, you can basically put your paints in a freezer. Uh, that's what I did with my uh, paint that I had before, just so I don't waste too much paint. In any case, now we're going to uh, see if we matched the color of the shadow. And it's a pretty good match. And it looks like the combination that we had before. So let's go ahead and double check that the uh, neck is in the uh, relative correct position. And so it's very nice when you are working over top of a painting that has color and you're able to match the color combinations. And that's also a result of the color combinations just being much more simple because we're using uh, more of a limited palette with this painting. So here we have the corner of the side of the mandible. A very simple shape there. And here's the ramus of the jaw. The ramus of the jaw is the basically the angle that the jaw makes. So that little angle right here. And all right, so now we're going to use a horizontal to look at the placement of the ear. So that is, we drew a horizontal line from uh, the nose to figure out where the ear needed to fit. So the ear is actually a little bit further down on the horizontal than the nose. And remember, we're building each piece of this puzzle uh, based on the previous pieces that we figured out. Rather than trying to figure it all out at once, we took our time, we're taking our time each step at a time. And let's just use one of the value shifts that we created on the palette to create the corner of the neck. And let's just make it a little bit lighter to create the uh, half tone and soften this little edge here all at the same time. And so again, the color combinations were not that difficult. And those were basically the color combinations that uh, pretty much give us the majority of the uh, flesh colors that you see on the face not very complicated color mixtures. All right, so now we're going to paint in the hair. So we're gonna start off with a uh, kind of a burnt umber-ish color to give us the boundary between the outside shape of the, uh, the top of the forehead and the corner of the forehead. And we're gonna try and uh, create a soft edge right away. Uh, so the edge between the hairline and the hair looks sharp in the photo reference, doesn't it? But in life, this edge would not be that sharp, especially right around here in this area. So the edge between the hairline and the forehead is actually a, an extremely deceptive edge. It's one of the most intricate edges uh, that you can work with on the portrait and probably one of the most intricate edges that uh, you can observe or that can be observed uh, because it's extremely subtle. Uh, it's not overly soft, but it is extremely subtle. And so the way we're going to tackle this edge is by painting in this uh basically division between light and dark uh, with a warmer uh, burnt umber mixture and then we're going to go in with the dark of the hair so we're basically going to sandwich the burnt umber 
outline in between the dark shape of the hair that we're mixing up at this moment with the alizarin crimson ivory black burnt umber let's throw in a touch of ultramarine blue in there um, so again we're mixing up a dark dark for the hair but now another thing the photo reference makes the hair look pretty much straight black doesn't it uh, but it is it is not straight black and so especially in nature if you're working from life the dark of the hair will not be straight black and so that's we're throwing that's why we're throwing in a variety of different colors in here uh, to change the uh, value so again we're going to sandwich the burnt umber outline in between the flesh color and the dark shape of the hair and the uh, paintbrush has a little bit of medium on it so the medium that I'm using is Neo McGill it's a gel like medium that's also a fast dryer alright so let's soften this little edge here now so we're going to be using uh, the values from the palette to soften these edges and we can spend quite a bit of time just trying to articulate the edge between the hairline and the forehead because again that is the most intricate edge possible now let's fill in the rest of the um, little outside shape with the dark value that we mixed up and so there's a little bit of a dark patch right over here and so we're going to just spread this uh, tone across the uh, the right side of the face as well remember all of these shapes are being placed in relation to one another and so remember the ear was placed based on using a horizontal line across from the nose all right so now we're going to place in some of the shapes uh, for the ear so we're going to start off uh, with the dark so the dark of the hair surrounding the ear so we're just going to cover a little bit more of the shape of the ear than we need and we're going to paint into that all right so now we have a half tone taken directly from the palette uh, so this is not a new uh, mixture this was pretty much just taken from the palette as you can tell even in the photo reference uh, that that color change is not that severe it's a very neutral color and even in life that plain change would be very subtle because it's receiving very little light therefore the hue would not change that much meaning that the uh, color is not a very uh, chromatic color it's a very nice and harmonious neutral color for the flesh of the ear and so now we're just painting in uh, the bottom of the, uh, the shape of the hair surrounding the ear so let's just make sure to cover some of the surface that we need to cover for the ear all right so now let's get into some of the lighter colors that we're going to use for the ear so we're going to just take some color from the palette and this is very much just the same color mixtures that I told you before not very complicated but we did just add a touch of cadmium red to make a little more of a pinkish color and now back to the colors that we had on the halftone region of the palette this little corner right on the side of the face is uh, pretty much a dark light because the ear is in shadow and the hair is kind of casting a shadow onto this side so it's a very uh, subtle and simple value change so let's just paint in some of these little overlaps of the hair and now we're going to get some more light into the corner right around here a little ear lobe right there not very complicated and now another thing i will say is that not all regions of the painting uh, need to be handled with the same uh, level of finish so we're going to keep the ear a little bit uh, more unfinished but we're still going to show all the necessary ingredients for the form so that is basically the light the shadow and the halftone we're going to even show the little overlap of hair 
as the uh, strain of hair goes over top of the ear. So we have the light and the dark of the ear, and now we need to get into the uh, a little bit of a half tone for the ear. So we're going to take some of the uh, half tone color right off of the palette. And we're pretty much going to leave the ear extremely abbreviated. Now it's going to be a very painterly ear. So here we have the a little bit of half tone for the ear. And we're just going to cover a little more light onto this little portion of the ear to suggest the rest of the ear. And now we're just going to uh, make this little transition between the uh, ear and the side of the face a little bit more soft. And uh, just a simple little brush stroke there as we approach the tragus of the ear, the little uh, part of the ear that sticks out right about there. Let's just make that transition a little softer, just making the edges a little bit soft in that area. And now let's just paint in some strands of hair, just a little touch there. And let's just ad adjust the uh, calligraphy of the hair. So we're going to leave the uh, kind of the background tone of the canvas to pretty much be the background of the painting. I just like painting sometimes where you can still see the tone of the canvas as the background. So we're going to just adjust the uh, shape of the hair. So this little individual brush stroke, let's just make sure we plan out the way that it looks. All right, now let's get to the, the neck. So let's first figure out the distance right about here. And we're going to just kind of eyeball that shape. And it comes to right about there, maybe a little bit lower. Let's just soften that little edge between the neck and the corner of the hair. So we're thinking about the calligraphy of the brush strokes for the hair and for the regions of the painting that are going to be a little less finished. So the neck is going to be a little less finished, but it's still going to contain the information that we want. So we're just kind of articulating the direction of the brush strokes for the individual strands of hair, trying to pay as much attention to the dynamic movement of the hair. Remember, hair also can give very nice uh, compositional element to your portrait paintings. So now let's move on to the uh, other side of the neck. Uh, so as we work our way around the sternocleidomastoid, which is the neck muscle, basically the little tube-looking muscles that you have on the corner of your neck, we're going to consider the influence that that muscle has on the shape of the neck. See how it's starting to curve around as the hair is falling around the back of the neck? And let's just create a little angle change right about here. Also trying to figure out the width of the neck. Now we don't see the full width of the neck because some of it is covered by the hair so we have to take that into account. And now with the same color combination that we had for the uh, shadow of the neck we're also going to use that on the back side of the neck as well. So let's just paint this little shadow shape right onto here using the same color combinations. Remember just burnt umber, yellow ochre, sap green, and a little bit of alizarin crimson, and a little sprinkle now and then of the lead white into this mixture. And that's all it is uh, for this shadow side of the neck. So let's just uh, paint that in there, trying to let's figure out what the shape looks like. So as we work our way down the shadow of the neck, Let's follow this little S looking shape. So this little S looking shape that we're painting in is the uh, pretty much the influence of the neck muscle wrapping around the structure of the neck. So that's creating that little S curve. So remember, we're still considering the anatomy and the structure of the neck, even though we're going to leave the area of the neck a little less finished. So let's uh, get into some of the flesh tone colors as we try to uh, paint in this edge now. So remember, you can paint a soft edge by kind of sandwiching one color in between two other colors. And so that's what we're doing uh, with the edge between the neck uh, and the hair. 
So let's go ahead and paint the hair in there. And again, we're thinking about the, the brush strokes. We're going to let some of these brush strokes show through. And let's let the hair go all the way across the side of the canvas. And right about here, let's just do some, some brave brush strokes, just trying to make uh, the calligraphy of the hair uh, look appealing to the eye. And so let's go back to the shape of the, uh, the shadow around the neck, this little S curve shape. And let's try to articulate the uh, shape, but also think about the uh, anatomy underneath of it. Remember, following around the backside of the ear, you have your sternocleidomastoid, and that is the neck muscle. Just think about it as the neck muscle. You can really feel your neck muscle if you turn your head uh, all the way as far as you can. You'll really feel your neck muscle uh, protruding out. And that's what we're painting in, but not painting the neck muscle in there as, uh, say, like the Incredible Hulk. Uh, instead, it's much more subtle. And really, the only influence of the neck muscle is going to be in the shape of the shadow itself that little S looking shape. And now let's just extend the, the uh, cast shadow onto the uh, shoulder right here. And let's get into some more of the uh, flesh tone mixtures. So we took some flesh tones off of the lighter uh, mixtures on the palette. And let's just add a little bit more paint onto this brush. And again, just taking the very simple combinations of uh, the red, yellow ochre, Burnt Umber, Lead White, and that's pretty much all we have uh, for the light, light planes right about here. I will say that uh, there is a little more influence uh, of the yellow ochre uh, for this top plane of the, uh, the shoulder as we are uh, moving around the bottom of the neck. So just making that edge a little bit softer. And we're not going to do too much. Uh, we're not going to apply too many more uh, changes to the shape of the neck. Let's just soften uh, this little edge right about here and let some hair overlap. And that's about it for that. Now let's move on to uh, the clothing that the model is wearing. So very simple combination of ivory black ultramarine blue. And let's just use a little more of our lead white into the mixture. And the brush has a little more of our medium onto it, so the Neo McGill. And again, I only use medium to thin out the paint. So I use medium to thin out the paint as opposed to uh, odorless mineral spirits. I use odorless mineral spirits to clean the brushes, but not to thin the paint. All right, so we're starting off with the shape of the shirt. I'm just trying to sketch that shape in there. Uh, not too careful with this shape actually. So let's just take some of the uh, darker flesh tone actually just to make a little warmer shape. And uh, we're uh, working with the darker shape first for the collar. Notice how we're working with the darker blue. With a little more ultramarine blue, a little bit more uh, ivory black into the mixture. And we're using quite a bit of our medium now, our Neo McGill and we're very much just going to sketch the uh, clothing onto the model. And so it's going to be very simplistic, very minimalistic, still using uh, our concepts of light and dark. So again, we're painting the light of the shirt. So we're going to work with the uh, cooler grays first. And so let's just sketch in a little cooler gray into there. And uh, quickly, we're going to combine the colors from the palette onto the shirt. The shirt is not this blue, so we're gonna take some more from uh, the flesh colors. But first, let's just paint the blue and just scumble the paint onto the surface. Again, to encourage that area to be uh, much more loose. And let's use it also to kind of draw in the boundary of the uh, placement for the other shoulder. And so we're going to use a lizard crimson, some burnt umber, and some yellow ochre and a tad bit of ivory black now to create the mixture uh, for the color that we're going to start off with for the uh, this little almost burgundy looking color for the uh, 
clothing that the model is wearing. So let's see, let's figure out that angle there. This needs to angle down a little bit more. And the, that angle might be too rigid, maybe too sharp. So let's get some paper towel and let's just carve a little bit of a smoother shape there for the shoulder. And again, we only use just a piece of uh, dry paper towel to carve that shape into a much more specific shape. And so now what we're going to do um, is add some more blue, a little bit of the blue into that burgundy. And let's just go ahead and combine the colors on the palette. Why not? Because uh, these colors are not as saturated um, on the photo reference as I'm making them. So let's just uh, neutralize that burgundy looking color because it was going a little too red and so let's use the same thing and paint right on top of the uh, drapery on this area here and just very simplistic very minimalistic or not going to do too much to the clothing and it's kind of an aesthetic thing it depends on your taste really I, I like when the uh, drapery or the clothing is a little uh, more free and shows a little bit more of the process. I just like the aesthetic of having areas within the painting that are a little less finished as opposed to having all areas of the painting finished to the same uh, degree. All right, now before we forget, let's define the edge between uh, the shoulder and the hair uh, because it, it it seems kind of lost at the moment so even though we want this to be a very loose and uh, fluid area of the painting uh, let's still get some dark dark uh, so a dark value and just uh, differentiate that edge we just want to make sure that this edge between the hair and the shoulder is uh, well defined and let's just uh, smoothen out this little shape right about here and now let's get some of the flesh tone color to paint in the light of the hair just a little strand of light there uh, for the hair color should do very nice and simple little brush strokes there uh, to indicate the light planes of the hair and these are going to be just about the final touches that we're going to be placing onto this portrait painting so there you have it that is the conclusion of this portrait painting video thank you so much for watching I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.